believe it is the duty of the vanguard political movement which brings about change to educate people's outlooks. I mean, in the same way that blacks have never lived in a, a socialist economic system, they've got to live to learn to live in one. They've got many things to learn, and all these must be brought to them and explained to the people by the vanguard movement, which is leading the revolution. The struggle of workers on the shop floor cannot be separated from the wider political struggle for liberation in this country. What we have to make clear to all and sundry is that a giant has risen, and this giant is going to confront all and sundry who seek and want to stand in its way. In 1986, we were still attempting to achieve some organizational cohesion. The most significant impact we had in that period obviously was May Day. And May Day was won in 1986 because in spite of the opposition of the government and in spite of the opposition of employers, we took May Day. More than three million workers participated in the stay away that was spearheaded by Kosato. There's a certain form of attachment that South Africans have for this country. Nothing would stop us from marching forward to freedom to a new South Africa, into a free country, into a country where they would fight for social justice, in a country where we would begin to tackle the problems of the, the poverty of our people. That's the sort of love and patriotic fervor that we had. Workers' Day is where workers are recognized. The working class is your average black person who have only their manual labor to trade for wages. They're recognized and they're given a day off. I think it started in the US, I'm not sure. And then it was... I don't know at all. What am I celebrating? That's the day I don't do any work. As an employer, it's easy to, you know, take advantage of the working class. If you're not in a contract, you, you have to go for um, and, and join a union. Most, most of the working class don't know their own rights. From the company, yeah. and fed his missiles and what, yes. what. That's if you're not a contractor. Manditi. I don't think while we are working under the department that we are working under a private company, we are allowed to have such kind of things. Who protects us? <laughs> I can't be a member of a trade union because I'm on contract. Someone once approached me. We'd say, you know, join, you know, are the working conditions okay, cost burning? And I was like, yeah, this shop, Mara. You know, they could be better. I know my mom's part of it. I know it fights for their rights. My mom's a teacher. If as civilians, do you think South Africa will function? Yeah, mom. South Africa won't function. South, South Africa won't function at all. Workers own South Africa. Without them, there'll be nothing. May Day, as I understand it, is a kind of holiday that celebrates the fact that uh, a long time back, the workers actually demanded eight hours of work, eight hours of rest, and eight hours of sleep. The history of Workers' Day is uh, within the trade union movement and only got recognized in South Africa in '94. However, the history of the day goes as far back as the 1800s. We talk about uh, a day that commemorates the role of the working class in South Africa in their fight for uh, their rights, but also in the fight for freedom and justice. Worker struggle, obviously, in terms of Workers' Day, was the issue of eight-hour working day. This was around the time where you had your South African Communist Party. 
but there was a problem. The communists, even at that point in time, hadn't incorporated also black workers. There were absolutely no rights for black workers in particular. They were not allowed to join trade unions. They couldn't bargain for their own kind of um, conditions of employment or wages. It's important to remember that after organizations, liberation movements were banned in 1960, the trade unions um, were the first really mass um, expression of discontent um, against the apartheid. It's really the workers and the growth of their labor unions um, which begin to drive the liberation struggle through stairways and a whole range of other actions. The state felt very strongly that if black people were to organize themselves, whether you call them labor movements at that point in time, they were also seen as an organized uh, entity that would fight also for the political rights. We talk about the role of trade unions in shaping the kind of the politics of the country. They were really important at a whole range of different levels. They were the largest organizations of black people. But more importantly, they developed the idea of, you know, in this current debate, consultation, democracy, popular participation, that's a trade union idea. You had then the issues where political issues and worker issues became, should I say, they merged into one, as it were. We all agree that the struggle of workers on the shop floor cannot be separated from the wider political struggle for liberation in this country. So when we, the people fought for the eight hours, it was not only the issue of eight hours. It was the eight hours, as well as the fact that, please recognize the fact that I'm also a human being. The issue of struggle of worker rights, it's an equivalent of human rights as well as political rights for us in the country. The role of the trade union movement uh, in shaping the current political landscape goes a long time back. You know, it was the trade, the, the trade union movement that started strikes in the 1920s, starting with the International uh, the, the Commercial Union and Industrial Commercial Union, ICU. And then later on, we had the strike of 1946, uh, which was led by J.P. Marx, who was uh, also a leader of the Communist Party. And when we talk about modern day uh, struggles of South African people, we cannot uh, uh, take away the struggles of the working class. They were at the core, they were at the center, because the working class, without the working class, production cannot take place. So when we talk about super exploitation in South Africa, we're basically talking about super exploitation of the working class. And we talk, when we talk about super exploitation of black people, it's basically super exploitation of black people as working class. In South Africa, I think um, working class here was pretty clearly definable because it was that large mass of black workers in urban areas that depended entirely for their livelihood on being employed by us and going to work in the morning and with no other sources of income except necessarily their basic wage. They don't own any property that generates income. They solely survive on selling their labor power. If they can't sell their labor power, then they don't have any means of survival. From a, a kind of from a statistical sort of point of view, you would include in that all of those that have a job, and all of those who are who are trying to find work. Workers lived and worked under very exploitative conditions. The wages were appalling, especially of migrant workers who lived in compounds. But um, black workers in general got terribly low wages. They were actually poverty wages. Workers' issues and the workers' movement uh, is crucial to forming a just society. In capitalism, there are two classes, mainly uh, in the capitalist mode of production, according to Karl Marx. He says there are two classes, uh, the capitalist class, which owns the means of production, and the class that does not own, but only survives on selling their labor to the capitalist class. Between these two classes, right, the class that is dominant is the class that determines the direction of society. But the class that is dominant in a capitalist society is the capitalist class. When we talk about uh, South Africa having all these problems of inequality, they are perpetrated by the capitalist class. 
So we need to support the struggles of the working class if we truly, truly want a just society because ultimately the struggles are between those two classes and those that do not belong to either of these classes have to make a decision which side of the struggle they have to, they have to side, on, side with. So if you side with the working class, you will be siding for social justice. Quality, <laughs> government <laughs> In South Africa, the economic development of a modern capitalist economy um, began as a very racialized development. Uh, the evolution of our capitalist system is based on the uh, colonial disposition of the vast majority of the African people of their land. Because remember, a worker is someone who does not own any means of production. When the National Party won uh, South African in South African Parliament, uh, introducing apartheid laws which cascaded from prohibitions on land ownership to even uh, conditions of work such that black workers were paid less than uh, white workers. There was a preference for white workers in terms of management. And that's created a inequality in the economy in that black people have earned always and historically the lowest wages and have never managed uh, uh, you know, any uh, office or work environment. If you look at the, the sort of patterns of pay in South Africa, um, um, I think what is quite striking is that uh, large n numbers of workers, especially African workers, um, especially African female workers, earn kind of incomes that are really, really low. Um, and, and I think that's part of the kind of unjust nature of our society. White people have always been elevated to the level of management and have been paid much better wages. And that has now got a historical, uh, has a legacy impact in the current uh, context in that black people are still poor and about 90% of South Africans' wealth still sits with the 10% of white people. Now, the challenge of the liberation movement was precisely to say they must break that. In other words, um, and the way it was understood to be broken was because it was clear that the concentrations of power in this country, it's not like all the whites are the owners of the world. It's a very small group. Um, it's extremely powerful. It's highly concentrated economically. And because capitalism was so racialized, it was white. Um, and it was not spread out in small industries. It was large industrial conglomerates and they held, they wielded this power through the economic power in the state. They were powerful in society, they were the brands in a way that commanded the way economic life was lived. I think the idea then of white monopoly capital is very old in South African discussions. It's got nothing to do with what's just proper PA, no matter how it gets used now, it's very old. And the challenge of the liberation movement was how do they break the stranglehold? of this group. In its struggle for freedom, any struggle for, for rights, and in, and in, in its struggle for dignity and, and humanity, the working class uh, needs to understand the dynamics of the very same system that, it, that exploits it. And it needs to begin thinking about the future society. 
And in that process of thinking, and in that process of fighting strategies and tactics against the capitalist class, it needs a group of dedicated people whose sole responsibility is to study and fashion the best strategies for the working class. Those are the intellectuals of the working class. Sometimes they are called the vanguard party of the working class, the communist party. Now, the, the, the problem at the moment is that there's been a bit of a separation between the vanguard people um, who've given themselves a title and the many, many other people who are organizing the life of the working class. And that separation has really meant that today, your opinion is just as good as the next opinion because you don't have this connection to that mess that changes society. Because that's where, according to the working class ideas, change is made as it was in, this, in, in the 70s and 80s by the ordinary people who begin to say, look, we can't live like this. We have to live in a different way. And, and in that sense, the, the ability to engage in radical economic transformation that was talked about in the 1970s, it's a very old idea in the 1980s. Um, the idea was people say, how do we want our lives to look like? The Freedom Charter was such an idea. Now the people of this country met in Cape Town and defined what they mean by freedom. They gave us 10 clauses and they elaborated how these clauses must take shape in the form of the Freedom Charter. And in the Freedom Charter, it is said that the mineral wealth beneath the soil, the banks, and monopoly industries, monopoly capital, monopoly industries, shall be transferred to the ownership of the people as a whole. What that statement says is that the wealth upon which uh, a white monopoly capitalism is based must be expropriated. We want land. Without land, we are nothing. Why would this South Africa belong to us when we have nothing to show that this South Africa belongs to us? South Africa, black people in this country, throughout, up to even in the boardrooms, experience white racism because the economic um, imbalances that are, uh, uh, if you like, based on the land inequalities, which have not been addressed. It's a shame. We need to be realistic about our issues. Firstly, we need to understand what is the basis of our struggle. So if we do understand that the basis of our struggle is the land, and clearly now the question is if we talk of a just society it would be a society that would one have to understand that at least in whatever way we utilize the land it should be utilized for the benefit of the majority nationalization it, it, it can be carried out in different ways for example, uh, different formulas. In Botswana, for example, what they decided to do is to say all the mineral wealth in Botswana is owned by the Botswana, and they're going to go into partnership with the private sector uh, on a 51%, 49% basis. You can partner. And in that partnership, because the state, which represents the people as a whole, is having a, the largest stake, um, that private sector that you engage with is not really white as well. It also must reflect the, 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 the demographics of the country and also if it, there's foreign ownership, the foreign participation in there, that foreign participation is also on the basis of the, the conditions set by the democratic state. The policy changes that we've approached have been gradual. So we start a nuclear plan now and that's that we're going to build up until 2025. Whereas the apartheid government's policy changes were immediate and they were shocking to the system such that they were able to actually redirect the progress and development of the of the economy. So whether national nationalization has a potential to reduce inequality depends on whether uh, politicians can still maintain integrity as opposed to uh, channeling all of those rents and income from nationalization to their own private pockets. Many in our society, having absorbed the value system of the capitalist market, have come to the conclusion that for them, personal success and fulfillment means personal enrichment at all costs and the most theatrical and striking public display of that wealth. I think we have serious problems with the whole issue of income uh, of income inequalities in South Africa. One of the statistics that we have in South Africa is that it would take take someone who worked uh, someone who worked for Shoprite, 
who was at the low end of the pay scale, it would take that person 1,200 years of work to earn the same that the CEO uh, that the CEO of ShopRite earns. And if we don't don't start to deal with these inequalities and start to design economic strategies that are going to start to deal with the problems, um, I think um, kind of our society is going to become um, more and more unstable. We're going to have more and more problems. We come from a past where people were exploited. And therefore, one can fully understand the school of thought that says, we will not tolerate any further exploitation of our people. If you want to buy our people's labor, make sure that it is done so at, you know, a reasonable price. The state is really tired at this point because the environment doesn't really allow much state intervention. So currently the only power and ability the state or government has to improve inequality is by setting a base for the lowest level of employment in terms of wages or the lowest working conditions such that things do not deteriorate below that. But that obviously still depends on whether the government has the power to enforce those laws. The thing that you must understand is that number one, we are dealing with the society of the people who live under the bread wage. Life is not good. I have to say that 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 Everything is up, my food, flower, my hint, they are too No, I'm going to I don't even think or at the time. I like, imbalance and almost everything that happens in the hood, it's not that particular stable, but at least it puts bread on my table because my, my, my kids still go to school and everything, so it's that particular thing. Can working people's lives be improved in a society that's capitalist? It's a question of context. There are societies where capitalism has improved um, the life of working people. In terms of capitalism, it's everyone for himself. You see, when we talk of living below bread line, that's another means test. You've been shortchanged in terms of education. And now your kids too are shortchanged. So it perpetuates uh, that destitution. You are forever destitute. The political cost and the economic cost of poverty for monopoly capitalism is too low. I think there was a time at the beginning of the kind of 90s when there was a lot of talk among them that, look, guys, this thing of blacks being so poor can go on. The gold is here, the diamonds are there, the chrome is here. You, you can go on forever. So the leverage is there. The issue really is going to be if capitalism resists this dramatic improvement that must happen, well, they may well end up with nothing. So capitalism will be forced to adapt. The best way forward, number one, we need to expropriate white monopoly capital, and take the mineral wealth of, the, of this country, redirect it towards high value addition, to support sectors that are labor intensive through industrialization. That is how we create jobs. 
Secondly, we need to expand social investment, i.e. we need to expand our investment in colleges and in, 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 in universities so that we can supply our people with the necessary skills and services, healthcare, education and so forth. The issue of education, it's very material. We would not address that immediately, but over time, it would obviously uh, settle uh, at a level where there would be an equilibrium. We need actual state intervention so that we can balance the, the playing the scales because the scales are tipped far more in favor of capital or investors and workers don't really have a strong voice and the South African trade union movement has been weakened as a result of this and the liberalization of the work environment. Whilst we are still trying to deal with socio-economic and legacy issues of apartheid, the rest of the world is moving forward and has actually captured the uh, labor market by providing cheap labor because of technological advancements as well as skills improvements in their economies. Currently workers have no power, have no bargaining power. Um, this is because we have high unemployment. So the challenge is that most people think that the, for, the fortunes of workers will improve when we employ more people. But this also reduces the bargaining power of employers. A minimum wage of uh, 3,500 rand per month has been recommended for South African workers. National minimum wage in South Africa, which will have national coverage, with a few exceptions which they will deal with, should start off at 3,500 rand per month. One has got to treat this issue with some amount of thought, and we shouldn't jump to quick, uh, we, we can really shouldn't jump to quick conclusions that are not based on some amount of evidence. So, I mean, if you push the wage up really quickly and, and, and that climb, climb is steep, then the kind of chances of unemployment uh, going up are going to be higher. So the key thing is you want to, to manage these processes in a way where you, you're not going to make it too hard on the employers, but at the same time, you want to deal with the fact that, that, that the level of the wage is quite low. 3,500 rand is the average wage that is currently being earned. So they did not do thorough research on what constitutes a living wage in South Africa as we speak. So what they did was to choose that level of wage which they consider not to hurt the profits of white monopoly capital. I think we would all accept that it's it's not it's not something we would classify as a as a kind of as a wage that we would call a living wage. But you know, if it's if it's going to improve the the lives of half of those who work, then it 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 sort of can't be a bad thing. And and uh, from the data that we have, it's likely to to lead to an increase in income uh, for about half of the workforce in South Africa. For, for, for ordinary people, the wage is my kid goes to school. I have a hospital when I'm sick. I can travel to town. Now, you can change people's relationship to the wage if society, in a way, provides from the common pool of society as well, the infrastructure that does this. If it was the other way around, it would mean that, yes, I was destitute, but now my children are given the opportunity. Now you are saying, I must move from my impoverished state and be able to educate my son or my child. Where would I get that money from? South African government needs to much, play a much more concerted role in developing black capital. And by that I mean black people owning business, black people owning the means to production. And this doesn't necessarily mean that we need to play the continuous monopoly game of large businesses. What is really needed is to decentralize the South African economy because through apartheid, the companies have developed and have become very huge, such as SAB, for example, uh, and other companies that have come from South Africa and gone to the rest of the world. Uh, but that makes it difficult for new entrants, Jabu, who has a stall at the corner, to then improve his food stall into a stand, into a business that he can then sell to mass 
people because of uh, you know the large conglomerates which have much more money and much more power, bargaining power in the economy. So what the government needs to do is to provide assistance in terms of uh, discounted capital. So they need to borrow to black capitalists at a cheaper rate. They also need to ensure that black people are actually developing their entrepreneurial skills. I think above and beyond getting employment or getting livable wages, South Africans need to revive the spirit of self-help within themselves. I'm part of the unlikely annoyed actually. I'm unemployed, I'm still looking. If it's job young sis and what it and abandon and ting input and was a good in sea. Tongue sevens. Yo, I know who scars near no story span unless net one a root man or someone was span I would end up fire. I'm a challenge spare and I will go on Saba way to Salago while I sit down. The unemployment, you say unemployed. Now, over 10 years, I'm looking up to parents actually. They are the ones that are helping me, putting food on the table. If I wasn't working for commission, I would probably be earning approximately 4.8 every month, but I was earning 2.5. Hi, Ogwa man, you go nzima kakhulu yonke into nzima. I manage 150, mang aina. I want you manage 150. Mina nkawa ngut maybe mang as creator something. Understand? Ngi bene start ya something, yeah. If I'm earning 2.5, it's 1,200 transport for every month for the whole of the month. I have responsibility. I have to support my kid. I have to buy toiletries, I have to buy food. It's not quite a job actually. Some sort of an a hustling. Your market sometimes na kona is stress because in you funega in you go to your market. So sometimes okay, you lama peace shop, maybe let's say lama peace shop and wineza, nya wa chola la oma send. The senior fuga in your market and is totally span, nyo buyan kaule. I regret quitting that job, but at some point when I'm just sitting and thinking about it, sleeping on it every time. I just feel that it's a waste of time and of which as just sitting at home, it's still a waste of time. In my view, uh, 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 in order to resolve the problems that uh, are afflicting the working class, like le low levels of wages, uh, living in squalor, in shacks, um, low life expectancy, bad health, the only way that these things can be resolved is if we begin to redistribute income and we begin to have a, a labor market that is socially just, that responds to the injustices. Because remember, the wages that are currently earned by the working class in South Africa, particularly the black working class, and the African working class in particular, are colonial wages. It has not been transformed since 1994. One shouldn't harp on the, on, on the past, but you shouldn't kind of also ignore it. I think apartheid and the, the, the nature of our economy uh, the way we've grown in the past all lend themselves to to the to the sort of types of problems that we have now because of uh, multiple you know apartheid and the unequal education that happened during that period black or majority of the labor force now doesn't have the skills required uh, by uh, employers in the workplace and the other explanation is also from a political economy perspective which is to say Actually, reducing employment reduces the bargaining power of employers. So if you want to maintain wages that are very low, you need to maintain high unemployment so that you can create a despair situation where people feel uh, you know, very honored to get the job despite low wages because they know the alternative is unemployment. Well, it is very difficult for the unemployed to try to fend for themselves. What you see, Fanon uh, um, and other writers, they started seeing the effects of uh, unemployment on the African continent uh, after independence. Um, another observer was uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, who said that uh, once you start seeing people pushing carts full of rubbish uh, along the side of the road, then you can see that, that that is an indication that the system is failing the people. When people look at debt and, and, and think that they can make a living out of debt, then it means that people are so desperate, their humanity has, has been so, so much destroyed. For me, the essence of our problem 
is it is it the level of demand in our economy is too low um, so so we don't have we sort of don't have the, the, the sort of purchasing sort of power that we should have in much of the townships much of the rural areas firstly if you're employed you're lucky enough in South Africa and the challenge is that even if you're employed, you're not getting paid enough. And the challenge about poverty is that it's a gift that keeps giving. So if you can't afford to get food, you have low nutrition, you have slow development, you can't actually perform at work. When you look at uh, South Africa's cause of unemployment uh, today, uh, many people think that we are unemployed because we don't have skills. We are unemployed because we are expensive. Unemployment in South Africa was caused by dispossession. People had the means of production, the land, and they were dispossessed from that land, and their employment depends purely on white monopoly capital. Now, white monopoly capital, its structure is such that it needs a sea of unemployment in order to discipline the ones that are employed. So the ones that are employed, when they continue to fight, basically what happens is that white monopoly capital uses the sea that is around to say, if you continue fighting for a high wage, we can draw in labor from, from, from the gate or from the region that is desperately looking for employment. The problem with what an attitudinal problem, I'm going to make an example with myself. I would wake up and I say, boy, come, let's do the garden. He would say to me, no, daddy, this is a menial job. That's the problem. It's our attitude is that once I've attained either some kind of graduation, it is that jacket that I have always to wear so that you must see my status. So this means that a lot of people aren't thinking of opportunities that they can exploit. Even anybody can spot problems on a day-to-day -day basis. And really what entrepreneurship is about is about spotting those problems and creating solutions. But if most people are geared to look for jobs and not actually solve problems in the economy, they're not going to exploit the entrepreneurial opportunities. The last bit of this also depends on the social capital that white people have that black people don't. So if a white person organizes a braai, it's likely that there might be one CEO, one director from some company, and if, they, if your kid is unemployed, you're likely to talk to someone. So the network exists, they have social capital, they can make the decisions to improve each other's lives. The problem with most black people is that we don't have the social capital. In most cases, if you're hosting a braai, you're probably going to leave with a loan from one of your friends. There is no uh, realization of the worth and the networks that black people have and how that, they, how that can benefit black people. And a large part of this is also as a legacy of apartheid through the divide and conquer and tribalism that was created during that period that creates much more competition amongst black people than it does cooperation. So South Africa has got the worst of all worlds. On one level, it has no social infrastructure to really deal with youth and youth aspirations and stuff like that. On the other hand, we don't have, in a sense, a retreat into land where people basically can just stay on the land. So South Africa has destroyed any capacity for small-scale farming. It's a very difficult issue because of large industrial farming that dominates the South African landscape. So, so, in a way, people are being pushed to the city, but the city can't absorb them. And all they do, they congregate around the edges of the city in massive settlements. They just keep concentrating around them. Well, there's nothing to live in the rural areas and push to the city, but the city doesn't absorb. The companies are mechanizing. It's becoming more and more difficult for them to absorb. In order to resolve the problems that uh, are afflicting the working class, the only way that these things can be resolved is if we begin to redistribute income and we begin to have a, a labor market that is socially just, that responds to the injustices. Shouldn't you be standing up and say, look, because there are no jobs in the market, let, let us just you know, stand up and do something about it? The reality is that you can't just wake up and do something. There has to be inputs that will make, say, make sure that you are able to come up with something. Mm -hmm. If you're going to start agriculture, there's land that is needed. For, for an example, there's a person to take agriculture. Mm -hmm. There's money to start that business. So it's not a matter of just waking up and saying that you want to start this thing, but it means that there must be effort. To be fair, I mean, lots is being done, right? So, we, so we're trying all sorts of interesting things to uh, kind of increase employment among youth. That's a, a, a kind of really serious problem. 
Um, I think we, we can do a, a lot more in that area around skills development, getting some, some sort of increase in the incomes of, of, of those, those sort of types of South Africans, I think should uh, kind of result in some amount of a boost in demand, which should then create employment. An injury to one is an injury to all. See, see, Kileka Basebezi. Kor Basebezi, Moho, Bai Popa, Nakanea, Hokanya Piri, or Bakono, who serialized to Kelo Tabona, Babukan. How they get a member by Asakapa, Pasa, my Nikapa, any other one near Union, get a member Motimo, but we want to have one of our TV at Tijuela, Abosuk. Slogan is I think times are changing, what times have changed. Support and win day as communities. Fella is gradually fading, Hobani, but to buy Chebili, Cantozabo, which is said. Harka Hutler, Rishabe, both it to Kalazaba Savit, Train with Kaluka, but Retanzo Musavit, Omun, Omun, Rehuaca, Vaca Kaleloyak, Kimaka Tonti, Mesaviti and Re Re quantify. What I teach high like a chalet, Kihonoka hoteling, Kifitla Kesavit, who are taking, Kitsibo Hakasavit, who are taking, Kesava Dijan. People, people should just hang in there and people should, should, should try and buy cities a kahore. There's hope. Uh, there's hope ho bane o keke wa dula fela wa re ha ke sebetse ka pa ha ke na se o nka iphidisang ka sona and ke ona tsela fela ya hope i think the injury to one is an injury to all is is probably a very human slogan in other words it's a slogan of empathy um of those it's a slogan of solidarity it's a slogan of recognition of our oneness um, in the world, in the universe. So it, it, it is a very powerful slogan. It's not just a trade union slogan. It's a social collective uh, motto that is supposed to inform the values of our society. This also resonates with the statement that, you know, a, str a, str a struggle for workers is a struggle for human rights. And the fact is, I think that trade unions, they've forgotten that. I think an injury to one is an injury to all means that we all defend our wages. I could pay my subscriptions diligently. I could attend all the meetings, all the marches. One day after that I become unemployed, I'm not a member. What kind of injury to one is an injury to all that this is? That when I am at my weakest, the slogan does not apply. The values of our society as we stand are dominated by the values of white monopoly capital, which says that you need to maximize profits, even if it means that the people you employ stay in shacks. If you get ahead, it's fine. You can do it. Look, you are educated. It's through your own individual effort where you are. So you are in a position now to move forward. So, so there's this ideology of individualism that is rampant, particularly amongst the black middle class. We, over the years, we've created this middle class and we also have an upper middle class and a, you know upper class of black elites, but it's not enough. And I think that the trickle down hasn't been quick enough, especially to the bottom, um, you know, the low income earners. So we've definitely moved away and moved much more towards individualism and modernism in terms of the identity of the individual being much more important than that of the group. And this also plays part in our politics, right? In that a lot of our leaders have been criticized for self-enrichment as opposed to enriching the nation or the public more generally. In South Africa, for instance, the idea that 
a society that respects people irrespective of their color, in its political makeup, in its constitutional makeup, did not come from those that have power. It came from those that were done wrong. It's not because they're just generous people. It's because they have no interest in the oppression of others. And, and, and the point then is to realize that to liberate this society from its racism, in the end, is to liberate the working class. If it is the interest of making our country better, then your efforts, coupled with mine and his, there would be no issue about your color or whatever. It would be more your skill. What are you doing? Clearly now, we've become more individualistic. As South Africans, if we were wanting a sustainable society, if we want a society that is going to be equitable, if we want a society that's going to deliver just outcomes, um, I think we have to accept that we're all in this together. We can't move forward without supporting that class fundamentally that is facing the capitalist class in the process of generation of wealth. We need to empower that class. And that class is predominantly the black working class. There's no way this country can move forward without a redistribution of wealth towards that class because that class is where the vast majority of the people are. The capitalist class in South Africa is less than 1%. About 10% of the population in South Africa belongs to what is called the petty bourgeoisie, which means that about 79% of the South African people are working class. So that is the 79% that is carrying this democracy and yet it's not benefiting from it. That is why we say the national wealth, the basic wealth of this country must be owned by the people as a whole and 79% of those people are the working class and it's us. Well, I think I'll talk about hope for the future. I mean, I made a point that this slogan of an injury to one is an injury to all is very much alive because otherwise we cannot explain why um, millions of South Africans continue to survive. The good thing about that is that that is the most important ingredient that the working class needs for it to organize and change things. If people have that and we can nurture them, then May Day's promise is realized. What South Africans still have, that is the real game changer for me, is that they have not been so defeated as to believe that I don't care what happens to my neighbor. If we can defend that, and use that to rebuild the energies that saw Posado being so important, that saw all those unions and student movements being so important. It is that gem that still survives. Let us say to the working class, you have something that's important in changing the world. If we can do that, then all those sacrifices will not have been in vain. The united strength of our people, the united strength of the labor movement, of course, independent from the imperialists, independent from the bosses, but allied to the people will determine the future of this land. Amaga! Please, sir. Please, sir.